Welcome and thank you for joining us for this special look at Muhammad Ali. This new documentary from Kim Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon is one of the most comprehensive films about one of the most legendary icons to ever call our Commonwealth home. So please join us as we explore the Kentucky roots of the greatest. Producer Sarah Burns discusses the making of the documentary, which included extensive research in Ollie's hometown of Louisville. And Renee Shaw hosts a panel discussion featuring Alice and Wade Houston, both longtime friends of Ali. Tori Murden McClure, who credits Ali as the inspiration for her historic row across the Atlantic. And Carlos Dixon, the world champion boxer from Louisville, representing the next generation of athletic achievement. We thank all of them for taking the time to participate in what will be a fascinating discussion. We also thank our generous Ali sponsors and patrons, including Alltech, Brooke Brown Barzen, Owsley Brown III, Augusta Brown Holland, Cave Hill Cemetery, Nana Lampton, McBrayer Law Firm, Steve and Amy Traeger, the University of Louisville, the Kentucky Historical Society, and the Kentucky Lottery. And we thank all of you for watching and supporting KET. Up next, special welcomes from Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher and renowned filmmaker Kim Burns. Enjoy the conversation. Hi everybody, Mayor Greg Fisher here. As the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky, the birthplace and home of the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, I am honored to be with you to celebrate the story and legacy of the greatest. Muhammad Ali has and will continue to captivate millions with his talent inside the ring and outside of the ring as a global humanitarian, controversial and inspiring sports champion of Sports Illustrated's athlete of the 20th century, activist and pioneer of change and unity. A quintessential figure, no doubt, Muhammad represented what it meant to be a leader, a black man in America in a time of unrest during the civil rights movement. Muhammad transcended the times with his truth, faith, activism, and accomplishments. He was driven to be the best so he could have a global platform to promote inclusiveness of cultures, nations, religions, races, gender, and socioeconomics, a message that is more important than ever and still rings loud and inspires millions today. Through this film, you will gain further insight into the champ beyond the ring, the father, the friend, the husband, the family man, the activist. Ali was, yes, ahead of his time, but right on time every time, and his spirit has brought us together even today. I'm reminded back to June of 2016 when all the world's eyes were on Louisville as we laid to rest the greatest Louisvillian ever, Muhammad Ali. Tens of thousands of people and hundreds of media came from around the globe to be a part of a celebration that will never be equaled. It was orchestrated, beautiful chaos, celebrating peace, diversity, and interfaith love. I want to give a huge shout out to Ken Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon for directing and producing this tremendous film along with KET and PBS. You all did an amazing job and I'm excited to join you on this journey as you premiere such an inspiring film for our hometown hero, Muhammad Ali. Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I wish I were able to join you all tonight, but part of the power of Muhammad Ali is that no matter where we are, he makes us all feel connected. Ali remains one of the most indelible figures of the 20th century, and to many of you, he was so much more. He was a friend, a neighbor, a fellow citizen, and an exemplary member of your great city. Ali's story is an inspiration to people everywhere, especially to those in Louisville who preserve and advance his legacy. Our team spent countless hours in Louisville during our filmmaking process. We are deeply thankful to the people of Louisville, especially the Brown family and fellow members of the Better Angel Society, the Ali Center, KET, and the entire public media system without whom this film would not have been possible. We hope you'll watch starting on Sunday, September 19th on KET or your local PBS station. Thank you for being here and for supporting public media. I hope to see you soon. 
for this fight. I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I have murdered a rock. I injured a stone and I hospitalized a brick. I'm so bad I make medicine sick. I'm so fast, man. I can run through a hurricane and don't get wet. When George Fulman meets me, he'll pay his debt. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. It's been said he was bigger than boxing and larger than life. He could bob, weave, jab, and rhyme. Welcome to this special program, Muhammad Ali, a Kentucky conversation. Thank you for joining us. I'm Renee Shaw. For the next hour, I'll be joined by Louisvillians who reflect on Ali's life and impact, each with unique connections to the boxing legend. Our conversation is in celebration of a new eight-hour documentary by filmmakers Ken Burns and his daughter Sarah and her husband David McMahon, simply called Muhammad Ali. It takes a multidimensional look at Louisville's most famous son, who went on to become the world's most charismatic and controversial sports figure. Can I have something you want for Oh, I don't want none. I won't take none. I won't take none. I won't eat none if you don't want me to. Ooh, look at that pretty horse. Oh, is that a white horse? See? Oh, now stand up. Look over there. Stand up. You got to stand up over that bill. See the big one? There he is. Yeah. <laughs> what? Let's go. earliest memories that I can think of as a child with my father are walking through airports and being in crowds and, and feeling in my the vibrations of people's clapping and shouts in my chest and just looking at my dad you know like who is this person and it was all the time anywhere we went you're the greatest we love you and the clapping and Muhammad I loved feeling all the energy and the love that he felt we now think of Muhammad Ali as this vulnerable guy lighting the torch in Atlanta, and everybody on the globe loves him. Black people like him, white people. He's a universal hero, like, but almost in a religious way, like the Buddha. But when he was in the midst of his career, and not just in the early bit, he was incredibly divisive. Boo, yell, scream, throw peanuts, but whatever you do, pay to get in. People hated him, whether it was along racial lines, class lines, Vietnam lines, political lines, religious lines, where they just couldn't stand him. And people, of course, had the opposite. And this was, I loved him, loved him. But you had an opinion about him. Look how pretty I am. Trim legs and a beautiful arms and a pretty nose and mouth. I know I'm a pretty man. I know I'm pretty. You don't have to tell me I'm pretty. I'm cocky. I'm proud. Never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. I say what I wanna say. Ain't no more big talk like this. He was a pioneer. He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. A guy known simply as the greatest. I am the greatest. I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. This will be no contest. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. To have that chutzpah and to be a black man in America was just, it was outlandish. Muhammad means worthy of all praises and Ali means most high. And I just don't think I should go 10,000 miles from here and shoot some black people that never called me. I just can't shoot it. I always wonder why Miss America was always white. Santa Claus was white. White swan soap. King white soap. White cloud tissue paper. And everything bad was black. Black cat was the bad luck. And if I threaten you, I'm going to blackmail you. <laughs> So Mama wanted to call it white male. They lie, too. I love being around him. 
I love being around Muhammad Ali. You gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a beast. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Ah, the price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. He called himself the greatest, and then proved it to the entire world. He was a master at what is called the sweet science, the brutal and sometimes beautiful art of boxing. Heavyweight champion at just 22 years old, he wrote his own rules, in the ring and in his life, infuriating his critics, baffling his opponents, and riveting millions of fans. At the height of the civil rights movement, he joined a separatist religious sect whose leader would, for a time, dominate both his personal life and his boxing career. He spoke his mind and stood on principle even when it cost him his livelihood. He redefined black manhood, yet belittled his greatest rival using the racist language of the Jim Crow South in which he had been raised. Banished for his beliefs, he returned to boxing an underdog, reclaimed his title twice, and became the most famous man on earth. He craved adulation his whole life, seeking crowds on street corners, in hotel lobbies, on airport tarmacs, everywhere he went, and reveled in the uninhibited joy he brought each adoring fan. He earned a massive fortune, spent it freely, and gave generously to family, friends, even strangers, anyone in need. Service to others, he often said, is the rent you pay for your room here on Earth. Even after his body began to betray him and his brain had absorbed too many blows, he fought on, unable to go without the attention and drama that accompanied each bout. Later, slowed and silenced by a cruel and crippling disease, he found refuge in his faith, becoming a symbol of peace and hope on every continent. Muhammad Ali was, the novelist Norman Mailer wrote, the very spirit of the 20th century. I'm always going to be one black one who got big on your white televisions, on your white newspapers, on your satellites, million dollar checks, and still look you in your face and tell you the truth and 100% stay with and represent my people and not leave them and sell them out because I'm rich and stay with them. That was my purpose. I'm here and I'm showing the world that you can be here and still free and stay yourself and get respect from the world. Muhammad Ali, the fighter, the humanitarian, the activist, knew he was destined for greatness. As filmmaker Sarah Byrne shared with us earlier, as tenacious as Ali was, he would have found a way to be the GOAT, even without boxing gloves. Sarah Burns, thank you so very much for spending a few minutes with us today. Thank you for having me. How did you go about uh, making this long form biography about a man that many Americans feel they already really know. Yeah, the film is eight hours, almost four parts. And we knew that we wanted to do something that captured his whole life. Obviously nothing can be truly comprehensive, but we wanted to do something that was gonna get to his family life, his um, childhood, Obviously, his boxing career, that's so important, but it's not just about boxing. We under, wanted to understand the spiritual journey, um, his draft resistance, all of these different pieces and sort of bring them, tie them together into one big portrait. And, you know, we initially thought we might do three parts, a six hour film, and we started writing and got to the third, ep you know, finished three episodes, and it was only 1974, and he hadn't fought George Foreman. Oh, wow. <laughs> is going to have to be bigger. It's just such a 
big life and there's so much to this story. And so we, it sort of kept growing in that way because we didn't want to lose any of it. There's also the fact that he was so well documented. There's so much incredible footage of him talking, speaking his mind in the ring, out of the ring. Um, and it was just this incredible wealth of material, of visual material. You could really get to know him um, through that on-camera material that was just extraordinary. And some of it's stuff that people have never seen before. There's a lot out there that people know, people who are Ali fans are mm -hmm. familiar with that stuff. Um, but there's a lot there that you haven't seen before, too. And I was just going to segue to that point. I can't imagine trying to condense uh, this brilliant humanitarian and athletes, a whole life experience down to, to eight hours. But a lot of uh, what we may see, particularly some Louisville footage, has never been seen before, I understand. And a lot of us, of course, know uh, his story and the story of the bike and all of that. And I'm really curious curious for you from you how often did you spend uh in in louisville how much time how much research and what did you come to understand about how louisville shaped muhammad ali yeah well we we all spent time in louisville i came and filmed a bunch of interviews um with his brother rockman with some um friends uh from the neighborhood people who he'd grown up with um, our archival team our producer stephanie jenkins and our co-producer tim mcalear spent a lot of time in louisville in archives looking for those photographs and that footage. Stephanie found some footage in the WHAS archive that we believe is the earliest existing footage mm -hmm. of young Cassius Clay checking in for a boxing match as a young teenager. Um, and so that's all really exciting, trying to find that stuff in the archives that people haven't seen before that helps us get to know him, especially the young Cassius Clay, mm -hmm. to, to get to know his early life better than we've been able to before. Um, and so it's, you know, we, we spent a lot of time trying to dig up that material. And um, certainly Louisville is hugely important in shaping who Cassius Clay, who Muhammad Ali was, um, for better and for worse. You know, he experiences the segregation of Louisville and it is painful to him. His father is frustrated by what he feels are the limited opportunities that he has as a painter. And that anger and frustration is something that he explains to his son. And, and um, that affects him too. He, you know, he hears about the murder of Emmett Till, not, not in Louisville, obviously, but that was something that affected people everywhere. And that's defining in his childhood and his experience about what it means to be Black in America at that time he's growing up. But he's also growing up in the West End in a really lovely community where he feels safe and secure and supported. And he, you know, in a, in a Black community where there are Black people who own their own businesses and there is a really great community there and he feels um, supported. And so there are these other ways that growing up in Louisville is the best possible thing for him. And his family and his neighborhood are hugely important to that. The film makes a good point of saying that it's more than just about his achievements in the ring, that he saw his purpose larger than being a, a world famous athlete and boxing champion, that he knew that he was meant for more than just what the ring could reward him. And I think that's what's so compelling, as you've already talked about, creating this broader narrative of who Muhammad Ali is and was, and the legacy that, I I'm curious what you think of his legacy that he leaves to other activist athletes, particularly in the time that we're in right now. Uh, yeah. How do you think it's impactful for them? Oh, I think it's hugely important. I mean, his daughter Rashida is in the film and says, you know, boxing was this much, mm -hmm. right? And that he was so important, so far beyond boxing. And I think she's absolutely right. I think that if he had never discovered boxing, I think we would still know who he is. Interesting. I think it, yeah, I, th I just think that boxing was the platform for him. It happened to be the way that he sort of achieved that ability to speak to the world. Um, but I think that I think Rashida is absolutely right. And I think he knew it himself from the time he was a child that he was sort of born to do great things. Um, and he he acted like it his whole life. <laughs> he understood the impact he had on other people. And I think that he. I think that that influenced what he did and why, because he knew that he had this um, 
this power, you know, this charisma, and that he really shared himself with other people. But I think he's absolutely incredibly influential in terms of athletes protesting, and not just athletes beyond that, but certainly, um, and there are so many athletes today who are using their platforms to try to make change, and they're all standing on Muhammad Ali's shoulders. I remember, Sarah, when the Muhammad Ali Center opened in Louisville, and it was an extravaganza. I mean, it was three to four days of, of coverage, and I was honored to be in the room. And when he walked in with Chris Christopherson, I mean, chills really went up your spine. Even in, in this time, by this time, you know, his health had really deteriorated, and he needed assistance in walking. But he put up his fist. And you just felt like that you were, I mean, you were in the midst of the greatest, but you also felt pretty great yourself. Like he had the ability to communicate with his spirit. I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm communicating that right or not, but it was something about just his aura uh, that was yeah. just um, hypnotizing in many ways. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And I've never been in the same room as him. But as soon as we started working on this film and telling people that we were working on a Muhammad Ali project, what became so clear was that everyone has an Ali story. Yeah. That everyone, there's just so many people on this planet who were touched by him. And sometimes it was even in those tiniest of moments, you know, when brief encounter on a street corner, him signing an autograph, um, you know, it didn't have to be a big connection. Um, and, and as you said, even sometimes no, not even speaking, right. just sort of being in his physical presence and what that meant. And I think that it's perhaps his greatest talent, more so than as a boxer, was his, was that ability to make other people feel special and feel seen and feel loved, um, even in these incredibly brief encounters. It's an extraordinary thing. I don't know that I've ever encountered another person uh, who had that ability in quite that way, yeah. just to touch people, everyone he came across. And it's you just you realize that when you start talking to people because. So many people have a story like that that they've carried with them for their entire lives from meeting him for five seconds. Yeah. I appreciate the indulgence of your time because, I, I, as I say, I could talk to you all day about this. And, and your father, Ken Burns, uh, summarized it this way in a trailer. He says that maybe you come to watch the film for the boxing or for the religion or the politics or the conflict, but you'll leave with an elevated sense of an amazing American. And of all of the things that we have discussed about uh, his faith and his resistance to the Vietnam War and dodge, uh, dodge, draft dodging, that he was at the core an amazing American. Absolutely. I think there's that sense of um, invention, of self-invention that is so American. You know, he was just himself. He was free to be himself and to take from all these different places and to, like, become this person. And he knew from, from being a child that he was going to be something special. Um, and he was. And I think that there's nothing more American than that. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, you and your father and your husband, for giving us this gift, I will say, of Muhammad Ali in ways that we hadn't seen or a reminder of just how great he was and the legacy that he leaves behind, particularly for those who are from Louisville and for all of us in the Commonwealth of Kentucky who claim him. Thank you, Sarah Burns. Thank you so much. So joining me now in our Lexington studio to share memories of Ali and his lasting legacy are Alice and Wade Houston, co-founders of the largest minority-owned transportation company in North America, HJI Supply Chain Solutions. Alice grew up in Louisville, just two doors down from Ali. Wade played and coached professional basketball in France and later was an assistant coach at the University of Louisville and then head coach at the University of Tennessee. And Tori Murden McClure, president of Spalding University. She was the first woman and first American to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean and received encouragement from Ali that you'll hear more about in just a little bit. And joining us from our Louisville studio is the current World Boxing Council Silver Youth Super Featherweight World Champion. That's a lot to say, like who so many others was inspired by Ali's greatness. And we thank you for being with us today, Carlos and all the rest of you. It's good to have you. And just seeing the clips of Ali, I mean, how do you feel, Alice Houston? And I want to start with you because I want to hear the stories of growing up just a couple of 
Commodores down from Cassius Clay. Okay, um, just so glad to be here. I could relate to so much of what was said, um, especially growing up on Grand Avenue. Grand Avenue was a, a long block uh, in the West End of Louisville, and it was, and we had artisans, we had principals, we had the first uh, African American race car driver, um, Joe Ray. There was just this sense of community that gave a foundation to all of us that grew up on that on that um, on that block. Virginia Avenue was the elementary school where Reverend Carl Liggins was the principal, and we recited the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, saying all three verses of "Lift Every Voice mm -hmm. and Sing," mm -hmm. um, as well as the national anthem. And what I'm saying is, we had a consciousness of blackness um, that carried us well and prepared us for the future. At Central High School, we were taught by teachers who, because of the laws, could not be educated in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So they went to Michigan, Indiana, Columbia, NYU. So we were being taught by individuals who were uh, uh, had been had the pleasure uh, and the uh, opportunity to be uh, taught by people who were writing the books, mm -hmm. and we were taught that <laughs> this is hard to to believe that you could win the game. You would only have twenty six cards, mm -hmm. but you could win against somebody with fifty two. But you just had to need to know how to play the game. And so I think that that foundation of growing up in that neighborhood um, manifested himself. And, and they said that, mm -hmm. that to grow up in that environment. But it was a segregated Louisville. Right. Our, our, our boundaries were 7th Street, Algonquin Parkway, mm -hmm. Market, and w within that confines. Um, I am sure that he felt it even more than I, because there was five years difference between us. Mm -hmm. But that foundation of Grand Avenue, and he would come back. He would come. Uh, we we stayed. We lived in 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 the house after after um, we got married, and he would pull up. And there would be this mob of people, and he'd <laughs> knock on the door. He completely disrupted anything that was going to go on. But he never forgot Grand Avenue or Louisville, Kentucky. He never, he was always announced as from Louisville, Kentucky. Right. Um, so it was, it was just, it, it, it was a wonderful experience to witness him, even though I, at a young age, I don't remember much about his, his childhood. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 it's, he, he's just a phenomenal individual. And I remember when I was um, 12, he gave me $25. So when they said generosity, he'd give to people. But he said, you, you, you can have this $25, but I want you to understand that you always have to treat people kindly because the same people you meet going up the ladder will be the same ones that you come meet coming down. Mm -hmm. Wise words and right. true. Yeah, and right. very true. And we all know about the red bicycle, the stolen red bike, right? right. And, and we want to show you a clip of the film. This is young Cassius Clay. This is his journey to become a boxer with this red bike that many of you know this story. And here's a little bit more about it. One day in October of 1954, 12-year-old Cassius rode his bicycle into downtown Louisville while Rudy sat on the handlebars. It began to rain, and the boys took cover in the Columbia Auditorium, where a home appliance show was underway. After the rain stopped, they emerged to find that the bicycle was gone. He had a brand new Schwinn, a beautiful red bicycle that uh, he shared with his brother. And he went running around looking for his bicycle and then ran back into the community center asking for help. Someone told him there was a police officer in the basement. He went down, and the cop in the basement was this Joe Martin who was running a little boxing school. Cassius told the story years later that for a minute he forgot about his bike because 
the sight of this boxing gym, the smell of the leather and the sweat, and the excitement, the action of boys in, in a ring hitting each other black and white together. And he, you know, reported the crime, and I'm going to get the guy, and I'm going to, you know, kill him. And Joe Martin said, well, um, do you know how to fight? Fight. And that was the beginning. Though his father was reluctant to let his son train with a white police officer, the lessons were free, and Cassius was eager to learn. At first, the young boxer did not impress Martin. He was just ordinary, the trainer recalled, and I doubt whether any scout would have thought much of him. Cassius didn't show any special talent right away, but he showed enormous passion. He knew instantly that this was what he wanted to do. Boxing was perfect for him because there's just two guys in the ring and your eye is always going to be drawn naturally to the one who's doing the most moving, who's doing the most punching, who's moving the fastest. And that was him, and he knew that he could get the most attention that way. Just six weeks after he walked into Joe Martin's gym, Cassius Clay had his first amateur fight. I, at that time, was putting on a local television show here in Louisville, and I had uh, amateur bouts every Saturday afternoon. The first bout I put him in, he weighed 87 pounds. After defeating 14-year-old Ronnie O'Keefe in a split decision, Clay immediately announced to everyone that one day he would be called the greatest of all time. He was always been a little bragging. I'm the greatest and all that before he even got to be the greatest. We'd say, oh, shut up, precision run in your mouth. But as he got better and better, we had more respect for him. Carlos Dixon, I want to come to you, joining us from our Louisville studio, professional boxer. So when you hear the kind of confidence uh, that a young Cassius Clay would be Muhammad Ali had, that, it seems like that's part of the formula. You know, that, that, that Mr. Martin said, Sergeant Martin said he didn't seem to have very much talent, but he had passion. And I want you to speak to uh, what you learn by watching Ali. Uh, and of course, a, a lot of age difference between the two of you, but what you learn from watching the greatest in the ring. <clears throat> um, one of the main things that I've always learned is, you know, confidence will carry you a long way. And if it's something that you believe in, um, it doesn't matter how hard or how difficult it may be. If you believe in yourself and you know that you that you see yourself at, um, at some point and, or at, at some level, um, you can achieve that. Um, that's just something that, that he kind of in, in boarded and in, in everybody, especially coming from Louisville, Kentucky, and growing up here, you know, you always you always hear, you know, Louisville, Louisville is, is Ali's city. And um, you always just want to be as great as him. You want to be as great as mm -hmm. Ali. So I've just, I've always tried to do that. I just wanted to be as great as him. That's just some huge, huge shoes to fill. That's right. Yeah, some big boxing gloves to try to occupy, right? On your Twitter, uh, you have, yeah. you know, home of the greatest. And you yourself, Carlos, in 2019, mm -hmm. you declared that you would be a world champion. So I think this confidence and bravado is just a trait of a champion boxer. <laughs> Am I correct? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I, I ended up um, I ended up going through training camp, and they told us that you know I had a, an opportunity to fight for the belt, and um, and I, I you know I claimed it. I claimed it when no one else seen it. No one else thought I was going to be able to do it, and and, and I said I was going to do it. And I had a, a very strong team behind me that that believed in me as well, and we you know we we all we made the we made it happen. You know the. The sport of boxing is, is brutal by its very nature, but there is a sensitive side to Ali that we understand, and almost a, a fragility. Of course, mm -hmm. we learned that later on with right. his illness, but even the compassion that he showed seemed to be very opposite of what it would take for the skill set for a boxer in the ring. Talk about how you interpret the multidimensional aspects of Muhammad Ali, to be tough when you're in the ring, but yet be gentle in spirit and humble when you're amongst the people. Right. Um, one of those things is, you know, you, you have to have the confidence. You have to have that when, when you're in this sport, just because, you know, it's, it's a soul, it's a one person sport. It's just you and, and another man and whoever's the best man that night, you know, that's, that's the, that's the victor. But, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of training. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And, you know, you can't, you can't, um, bypass that. That's something that you, you just can't do. You have to, you have to put in the work and you have to put in the effort in order to be able to, to really declare that, and um, that's just that's something that I've that I've always took from him. You know, he worked extremely hard, and it's always the work that no one else sees is what's gonna um, bring you, you know, the success. 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, we don't take away his glory because you don't know the full story, right? We often say that. I want to go to you, Mr. Exa yeah. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Wade Houston, I want to go up to go to you now. You grew up in East Tennessee, and you're an athlete, uh, played professional basketball, coached, et cetera. So I, I want to know about the mindset of an athlete and what, even though you were in a different sport from Muhammad Ali, what you took from him, what impression did he make on you? You know, my, my first encounter with, with Ali was when he came back, um, I guess maybe in 73, and uh, Alice mentioned it, but we were having our second birthday party for our son, Alan, mm -hmm. and this uh, kid came up, knocked on the door and said, Coach Houston said, Ali's outside. I didn't believe him because he had <laughs> he'd already become my hero at that time uh -huh. because my dad was such a huge boxing fan and, and from Joe Lewis on up and watching Ali in the Olympics. And um, so anyway, so the kid knocks on the door, I go outside and he's been driving this big recreational vehicle, which he used to do <laughs> during that time. So um, I go out and sure enough, it's him. He's uh, sitting out driving. He, he says, uh, he said, uh, the, the Keens live here? I said, I said yeah, they, they still live here. So I said, Alice, my wife lives here. He said, uh, Alice is your, is your wife? He said, he said, I said, yeah. He said, well, you don't, you don't belong here. So this is not your neck of the woods. So he said, I grew up here. So, so anyway, so he gets out of, out of the, um, out of the RV, comes up to the house and we got like 20 kids in the house, my, my son and, mm -hmm. and, uh, 18, 19 more, two year olds. And the first thing that I saw and noticed when he came in was how those kids just gravitated to him. Right. And, and that's unusual for a stranger to come in like that for two year old kids. And it just so happened that he had fought Ken Norton, I guess maybe about two or three weeks before that, and, and he had, Norton had broken his jaw. Mm. So his jaw was wired shut, um, but he was still talking. I mean, even with the even with, with, the, with, even with, wired, with the wired jaw, jaw he talking, was still huh? talking. But, <laughs> and then the last, the other thing that I really took away from just meeting him and spending time with him was just how tough he was uh, having completed that fight against Ken Norton with the broken jaw and the pain that he went through. And he talked about that a little bit and how his toughest fight was the one in, in uh, Manila against Joe Frazier. Mm -hmm. he, he said it must have been 130 degrees at ringside and said he had fought Joe Frazier, with every, hit him with everything he had, but Joe Frazier just kept coming. He said in, in, this, in, the, in the boxing world, he said, you cannot give up. He said, you can't quit, mm -hmm. and, and you think you know what it's about until you receive that first punch. So as a coach at that time, I, I just it, it, it instilled in me how you talk to your players about never giving up, never quitting. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the one thing I took away is how with, with the Ken Norton fight and then with the Joe Frazier fight, how he just stood in there and fought and didn't, never gave up. Yeah. We have another athlete, a panel full of them, actually. <laughs> Tori Martin McClure, who's president of Spalding. Thank you for being here. And you've set your own athletic records. And and what people may not know is your connection to Ali, that you worked for him. So we want right. to hear about that yeah, I was, and, and how he inspired you. Yeah, I was the first full-time employee at the <laughs> Ali Center. And, I, you know, Muhammad had a soft spot for broken people or broken nests. And he mm -hmm. could see see that and he didn't care what color you were if if you were hurt he he could see that and i went to work for him after i'd failed to row a boat alone across the ocean and i was destroyed as a human being just sort of going through the motions but i was really devoted to doing my job at the ali center and creating this center to honor muhammad ali and i got my hands on every book i could get my hands on but he saw where i was and in in many ways lifted me up off the floor Hmm. I was going through the darkest period in my life, and he was just magical. He, he just exuded compassion, and so that sense of my five minutes with Ali, it was more of a, almost a year. Right. But he, when he knew I was ready, he said, you, Tori, you don't want to go through life as the woman who almost rode across the ocean. Hmm. So I went oh, back wow. and I finished. Mm -hmm. And now I'm at Spalding University, which owns the Columbia Gym, mm -hmm. where he learned how to box. Mm -hmm. And so that full circle... Of, of experience and and two amazing people have written a, a musical based on my book and Muhammad Ali is a character in this in this musical called Roe. Yeah, yeah. And, and tell us more about that. Yeah, so I, I'm an introvert. You can't spend two and a half months alone in a rowboat if you're not an introvert. <laughs> Muhammad Ali was not. Mm -hmm. And there's this uh, chapter in my book where I talk about going to work for Muhammad and and I make the observation that Superficially, we, was, we were as different as we could possibly be. I've had this wonderfully privileged education. Muhammad 
was educating himself in the gym. He, he ran from Central High School to Nazareth College, now Spalding University. He worked for the, the sisters for a couple hours, napped a fair amount. <laughs> <laughs> he, went, he went to the Columbia gym from six to eight o'clock to box for Joe Martin. And then he rode his bike to Smoketown and, uh -huh. he, and he boxed for Fred Stoner and, and credits Fred Stoner for really teaching him the art of boxing. But he stayed there till midnight. Oh, wow. And then he'd get up and he'd go to school sort of. And then he'd go, but, but, the, but what is often overlooked is yes, he had gifts, but he did the work. Yeah. And there was a lot of work that, that went into it. But anyway, he's a, he's a character in this uh, really amazing musical that I have nothing to do with. Well, so but we're going to look amazing. for it. Let's yeah. do it on Audible because we, and we know it's going to be yeah. awesome. The principles uh, by which he governed and guided his life. Uh, and you too have very similar goals. You've been spoke, outspoken about criminal justice reform and racial equality when it comes to higher education. Uh, talk to us about that part of Ali that you connect with. Yeah, I did not know until my, I wrote a book about rowing a boat alone across the ocean. It's called The Pearl in the Storm. And it was categorized as a nautical book and sort of buried. And I thought, okay, well, it was accidental, you know. And then this weekend I discovered that Muhammad Ali had an autobiography that I knew nothing about. And I am a student of Ali and read, you know, the probably 70 or 75 books about <laughs> mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, and I bought as many as I could afford and borrowed the rest from the library. I did not know until this weekend he had an autobiography. It is a powerful set of, set of stories about growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, and it, and it is painful, and it is raw, and people need to read it. The main public library in Louisville has one copy, and it's non-circulating. Right. This is wrong, and, and that sense of his book being buried because at that point in his life he was a controversial figure. It was published in '75, mm -hmm. and it's been it's been republished since. But I I wasn't aware because it was 2015, right. and I had I I was working at, as the president of Spalding University a at, busy that time. at that yeah. time. Right. But that sense of of here's this amazing human being who was being veiled and hidden and pushed aside, uh, and it's a, it's a story we need to hear yeah. um, in its rawness. That's it's, right. it, it, it may not be great literature, but it's great history. Right. And very poignant for the time yes. that, that we're in. Um, as the 20th century came to a close, the media proclaimed him the athlete of the century, but the film explores how he evolved to become bigger than boxing, as we said, guided by his six core principles, which are confidence, conviction, dedication, respect, giving, and spirituality. Ali, late in life, talked about this tallying angel, he called it, that there was an angel up there who counted all the good things you did in life and all the bad things you did in life. And if you had more bad things than good things, you were going to hell. And he had a very vivid impression of what hell meant. And he acknowledged that he had a lot of negative marks, that the tallying angel was not going to be uh, happy with the way he had treated women in particular. 30 years after Ali first faced Joe Frazier, a reporter asked him about their long-running feud. I called him a lot of names that I shouldn't have called him, Ali admitted. I apologize for that. I like Joe Frazier. Me and him was a good show. Frazier never forgave Ali. Later, he expressed sorrow at having abandoned Malcolm X. Turning my back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes that I regret most in my life, he wrote. I wished I'd been able to tell Malcolm I was sorry that he was right about so many things. Daddy evolved, he became better. And Daddy said that I'm bigger than boxing. That meant boxing was this much. His evolution into the person he is today is way bigger than him just boxing. And I think he knew that. And he carried it with him, his love. And he gave it to every single person he met. And I think that's beautiful. As the 20th century came to an end, Newsweek, Time, and Sports Illustrated all named him Athlete of the Century. 
In the days after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American Muslims were the victims of hate crimes simply because of their faith. I am a Muslim. I am an American, Ali responded. If the culprits are Muslim, they have twisted the teachings of Islam. Whoever performed the terrorist attacks does not represent Islam. God is not behind assassins. What I hope is that Muhammad Ali will be a constant reminder uh, uh, to America of just how thoroughly American a believing, practicing, sincerely committed Muslim can be. Whatever one's background is, Ali belongs to America, all of us. And I think that he belongs to all of us because he affected all of us. And I hope that that's part of the legacy that he will leave, that America won't forget Ali as this American Muslim with, with equal emphasis on American Muslim. On November 9th, 2005, President George W. Bush presented Ali with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. That same year, the Muhammad Ali Center, a museum dedicated to his life and legacy, opened in Louisville. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to reach us a certain way and to move America in a certain way, and to move individuals in a certain way. I'm going to take this path. I believe that I'm right. And even if I'm not right, I'm still me. And to be able to follow that and to know that there was going to be an enormous price to pay for that and to have that be generational, to have that live on beyond you is extremely valuable. Everything that he did couldn't be undone. Sorry, Martin McClure, I'm struck by that last pictorial image of that young girl in the protest position, but with the Muhammad Ali shirt. Mm. I mean, does that strike you any particular way? Absolutely, and, and I wonder uh, about so many, I went to divinity school mm -hmm. and, and studied Islam, and so much of our Islamophobia, I wonder how much of that ties to the nation of Islam. And our, and our prejudice and our fear. And, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was all for the education of women as well as men. And Muhammad understood all the nuances of that and that we only know the surface of things. And, and, and even in, in Afghanistan, we, we blame Islam. It's a cultural choice to educate boys instead of girls. We did it here until the 1970s. Women couldn't go to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale because it was reserved for men. But that sense of women feeling empowered by Muhammad Ali, and he was, he was so compassionate to so many people. And that sense of that 30 seconds with Muhammad or that, mm -hmm. that longer period of time with Muhammad, he, he had, again, that sense of he could touch that part of you that felt weak or wobbly and lift you up. And the fact that he came to understand the error of his own ways, Alice mm -hmm. Houston, that he apologized to yeah. Joe Frazier, that he uh, tried to atone for his infidelities, right? That he understood uh, the flawed nature of, of being a man, not just this heralded boxing legend. You know, I, I um, often wonder what it would be like if he were here now yes. in this particular stage of our history. I know that he can, would make an impact, but I think that movies and films and reading about his life and his journey can make an impact too. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that these kinds of, of things that we're doing, especially in these times, are tremendously uh, important. And I, you know, I've been around athletics all of my life, and I, I've always looked at him and said, who would make that kind of sacrifice for what they believed in mm -hmm. at the prime of their career? Right. And um, as we talk to young people and young athletes um, whose shoulders he, they stand upon, mm -hmm. um, the conviction, the core principles, the spirituality, the generosity, um, um, I think that you can take a Muhammad Ali and do a case study mm -hmm. 
that that in and of itself can be a curriculum for young people um, and for athletes that would be uh, just so beneficial. A profile in courage indeed. Yes, and yeah. I want to get the thoughts of Carlos Dixon. When you think about the the level and the degree to which he risked a lot uh, at a time when he was at the top of his game and, and did not muzzle himself when he saw injustice, uh, how, how do you interpret that? And how does that inform how you carry yourself and how you hope that the boxing world will respond to the legacy of Imam Ali, who stood for what was right when he thought it was right. Mm. See, that was just one of the things that was just, well, one of the many things that he had that was just extremely selfless. You know, um, he didn't care much about, you know, his, his career. If he stood on something and that's just, that was it. There was no, there was no extra talking about it. That's just how he, that's how he viewed it. It was going to be that way. And, and that was just that. And, you know, it, 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 it takes a, it takes a special person in order to be able to, to do that. Just, you know, think possibly, Hey, I could, this could, this could stop my career. You know, this could stop the way I, I feed my family and whatnot. And, and he didn't, he didn't care about that. Just he, he stood on what he believed in, and that's just one of the many things that he was able to do um, with his platform and in his life that was just extremely selfless and amazing. Yeah. Well, the world said thank you to Muhammad Ali at the 1996 Olympics when he emerged with tremoring hands lighting the torch. It was an emotional scene that taught us more than what the visuals of that moment showed. In 1996, the Olympic Committee, planning the Summer Games in Atlanta, asked Muhammad Ali to light the torch at the opening ceremonies. At first, Ali declined. He didn't want to be seen shaking and stumbling on that stage. But his friend Howard Bingham convinced him, this is the thing where the world is saying, thank you for all that you've done over your life, Bingham told him. There will be three billion people watching. The plans were kept secret. Do you recognize her? Janet Evans. Considered the greatest female distance swimmer of all time. And it was planned very brilliantly. I mean, people really thought the swimmer, Janet Evans, was going to be the person who was going to light that torch. But instead, out of nowhere comes Muhammad Ali. <laughs> seen him in a while you know he was sick and when you would see him he was clearly uh, showing the effects of the illness but he hadn't been seen that much and then here he is in this big prominent moment and he's holding that torch and he's shaking and I, I man I'm about to cry now it was hard to watch because you don't want to see your guy like that you don't want to see that but you, you saw it. He was defenseless now. He can't hurt us anymore. You know, he can't make us mad anymore. Because now he's, he, the game that we ask him to play to entertain us has left him looking like this. Now we feel some sympathy, if not guilt. We, we see him shaking, trembling up there, the most beautiful, moving, the most beautiful athlete in motion you've ever seen. And now he can't hold the torch, you know? So we feel guilt and we feel sympathy. We want to hug him, we want to embrace him, we want to ask his forgiveness, you know, everything, for every reason that we disliked him, now we love him, you know, because he was right. It was striking to see this evolution, not in Ali, but in us. It just struck me so amazingly to watch Ali riding this torch, people weeping. It's amazing. 
and you and you cast back not so many years before and some huge amount of the country thought this guy was the antichrist where they chose to hate him where they made him a foil to the other guy that they like better and it's entirely possible that human beings are capable of learning something i'll take the long road yeah, yeah. The outpouring of love caught Ali by surprise. Parkinson's robs you of confidence, Lonnie told a reporter. Now he knows the public will love him and accept him, no matter what he has. As human beings, we're quite capable, Wade Houston, of learning, of understanding each other. And in that moment that we saw the replay of lighting of the torch of the 1996 opening ceremonies at the Olympics, we learned that, didn't we? We did, we did. But you know, I think once in a lifetime, someone comes along, at least for me, that she just, um, you never forget, you understand sort of why they're here. <laughs> and that's, that's the way uh, it was with Ali. You know, we just, uh, he, he was our hero and, um, we, we just looked up to him so much and simply because of, as Carlos was saying, was saying earlier, you know, he just gave up so much and not many of us would have done that. That was a time when, when athletes were getting commercials and they were doing all the, getting all the things and starting to make money, but he just forgave all of that and just did what he wanted to do. Yeah. You know, I, I hear what everybody says, but that scene to me showed his vulnerability, mm -hmm. his com compassion, his humanity, and his strength, right. and I, courage. And I think now we're seeing the fruit of that because we have athletes who can own their mental health issues. Yes. We have athletes who can step up and say, I have suffered, I have been broken. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and Muhammad's willingness, the courage to be that vulnerable, mm -hmm. opened the door to athletes being human. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that is one of the greatest gifts I think he's given us. Yes, Carla Stixon, I want you to chime in here about that. that. That is a great display of strength, even though some may interpret it as weakness. But how do you see it? <clears throat> I see it as, like I said, it's extremely selfless and, and heroic. Um, just for him to even put himself out there the way mm -hmm. that he has, you know, it, it was it was amazing, and that's one of the reasons why he is the greatest, you know, because he took the he took those steps and he took. Every everything that he did, he took it right on the chin. Any anything that that he believed in, anything that he stood on, that's exactly what he did. Is he stood for it? He stood exactly on it, and he didn't. There was no wavering. There was no going back on it. That's just how it was, and that's why everybody loves him the way that he was. Yeah. Is there ever going to be an athlete like Muhammad Ali? You know, I, I don't think there'll ever be an athlete yeah. like Muhammad Ali. He's 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 the greatest for a reason. Um, and just for somebody to even to do it, and not just in those times, but you know, even the times now, it's 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 amazing. Yeah. And he was such a world figure. I mean, I think sometimes we forget that. Mm -hmm. And we we were in Dubai a few years ago, and uh, uh, Princess Shia, who we had a chance to meet with the group, and we were told that you could spend just a minute with her and just move on and the protocols, what you do. Mm -hmm. We told her we were from Louisville, Kentucky real quickly and said we were friends with Muhammad Ali. Uh -huh. And her eyes just lit up <laughs> and, and she kept us there for I don't know, 20 minutes. Uh -huh. And the story she told us was amazing. She said when she was a youngster, she wanted to be in the equestrian games and had no confidence, but she wrote to Muhammad Ali and said, what can I do to improve my, uh, what I'm doing with the equestrian events? And he wrote her back, said, just don't give up, keep, keep the yeah. faith. And she said she kept that letter forever and ever because he wrote that letter back to her about trying to be in the equestrian games. Wow. He corresponded with Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre. I mean, yeah. he, he, he corresponded with some of the greatest luminaries of, of our mm -hmm. time and, and, and made them small. Right, yeah. right. And made the small people feel people big, big. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? That's a real gift. And the gift to Louisville, Alice. Oh, the gift. To Louisville is immeasurable. He put us on the map in a way that we had not been on the map before. Mm -hmm. And as we saw at his home going, mm -hmm. <laughs> the love that the community felt, which, and then the world was able to share. Um, I don't think there'll be another gift like Muhammad Ali to Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. And I don't think that there'll be another athlete with the 
looks, the yeah. charm, the wit, the talent, and the compassion. Yes. All rolled into one marvelous human being. Yes, and the poetic nature, <laughs> yeah. right? To come off with those limericks. Uh, it, it is just amazing. And this documentary that it, we've said is, is eight hours long. And I would love to know what made the cutting room floor uh, because sometimes those are the interesting nuggets. And so, um, Tori Martin McClure, I want you to kind of give us your final thoughts as, as you settle in to watch this and you can stream this on the PBS app and we hope that you'll watch it on KET when it airs. What do you hope that Louisvillians and Kentuckians learn to appreciate about Ali that they hadn't before? Yeah, I don't think there'll be another athlete like Muhammad Ali, but I think all of us are called to be a little better and a little stronger mm. and a little taller and that we should follow his example when we can. Yeah. Mm. And the Muhammad Ali Center, if you haven't been, you should go, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you just went the first yeah. time when it opened, there's so much more now there, Carlos Dixon, to see. It truly is an inspiration for younger generations. And everybody who has gone there has come back with a, 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 a better perception of Ali, of the city, and of boxing, and of humanity. Mm -hmm. Carlos, I'll give you the final mm -hmm. word. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, if, <laughs> it's, you know, it, Ali is, is the greatest. You know, I just, I just want to, I just want to take a little small page out of his book and, and just try to be as, as selfless as him and as, and as amazing as that man truly was and, and completely is. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Wade, we've got a few seconds. Final thought? No, again, he was just, uh, he meant so much to the city of Louisville. When I got here from Tennessee, I just didn't know what to expect. But, but when I found out what he meant to the city, it was just amazing. Yeah, and that he still, uh, you know, just wanted to be around the home folk. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, you know? He, I am sure that when we moved out, that somebody got the surprise of their life <laughs> when <laughs> Ali pulled up right. and said, is Alice Carroll in here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate all of you sharing your memories and reflections and inspirations, right? And I hope that you all will take the opportunity to watch this magnificent eight hour special about Muhammad Ali. Just the title, just the name, just the man. Doesn't need any kind of fancy add ons. It's just Muhammad Ali. And he is Louisville's favorite son. And for so many of us, he means so very much to us to this day. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Renee Shaw, take good care and I'll see you soon. Alltech is helping to nourish the world and create a planet of plenty for all. With a shared passion for inspiring change and making a difference, Alltech is proud to support this presentation of Muhammad Ali. The Kentucky Lottery. One in five Kentuckians has received a college scholarship or grant with funds from the Kentucky Lottery, including the Keys Program. Fueling imagination, funding education. KYLottery.com. The Kentucky Historical Society, where the treasures from Kentucky's past chronicle the endless stories of people who fought for a better tomorrow. More at history.ky.gov. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to move America in a certain way. I have too much to fight for, cause to fight for. There was going to be an enormous price to pay for that. Boxing was this much of his evolution. The person he is today is way bigger. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Muhammad Ali starts Sunday, September 19th at 8, 7 central, only on PBS.